for the next 20 minutes or so is biologic width in context of the restorative sphere. So when we think of biologic width, I, I bet we think, eh, that's something my periodontist needs to know. I need to know of it. I don't necessarily need to know too much about it. And the answer is the periodontist needs to know, but we also need to know. So that's what I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about. Where does it intersect with a restorative dentist? Uh, before I switch to my screen, does anybody want to share any challenges they've had? You know, Christian, you and I have worked pretty closely on this over the past year. Do you think it pops up often? I lost you for a second. Where are you? There you go. Um, what do you mean, biologic width itself, the topic? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, in school, we're, we're taught a lot of things, and that's one of the million things. And I think when it comes to what are the things that actually have um, application in our everyday practice, it's hard to know of, what, of those million things, which one of them are actually relevant. Um, I, and obviously, I, I, they're, they're at varying degrees of relevancy. And I would say I this so. one is probably high on the list. So I just wanted your, your take on it. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I was actually, um, I did a case today. And I was actually talking to Taylor about what I was doing and the, the measurements I was taking. We did a flap on eight and nine. He had subgingival decay. When I finally went in there, the decay was right at the bone level. I ended up taking all the measurements, telling her what I was doing, bone, bony architecture, everything. So I, you asked that question. It's funny that you asked it because I even did that today. <laughs> yeah, I, Dr. Libby had one, and that's kind of where the thought came from. Um, I have a whole backlog of topics that we can go over, but when something seems to surface and show back up from time to time, um, I think it's speaking that we need to, to touch upon it again. So what I'll do is share my screen. And I have a really good uh, picture from Spear. Spear's done many things for my career. It's done many things for many dentists' career. But one of the things they've done really well is uh, create content that sifts out a lot of the extraneous weeds. And I think this to be one of one of those things. Uh, Christian, can you see that okay? Yep. Cool. So let's just start with what is biologic width? And I'll be the first to admit that for a period of time, I thought biologic width included the sulcus. It does not. I don't know where my confusion came from, if I was falling asleep during the lecture in dental school and I misunderstood or somebody taught me differently. But as time went on, I realized that many dentists had this misconception that biologic width includes the sulcus. And it's really, it's a nomenclature thing. So I don't think we need, we need to wrap our heads around, okay, what's the exact term of biologic width? It's the concept and what the concept does for us clinically that's important. So if we want to break biologic width and the sulcus, and we'll call the three of those, sorry, um, the bio biologic width plus the sulcus, those two things, we'll call that the, the periodontal zone. Um, <clears throat> if we break the periodontal zone into all of its components, then we take biologic width and we separate it into its two subcomponents, which is the connective tissue, and then the epithelial attachment, long junctional epithelium is another term for that. And if we look closely, we can actually see that the epithelial attachment actually is epithelium. Uh, I believe it's a board question, what kind of attachments are those? We may recall hemidesmosomes being the, uh, the actual cell that attaches to the root surface. The important thing to remember here is this is a loose attachment. It's also the attachment that's likely to unzip very quickly during periodontal compromise or periodontal disease. Whereas the connective tissue attachment is a much more robust attachment. And if we get periodontal disease into this zone, that's when we start to get a uh, breakdown of the bone and we see bone loss as a result. So let's just start with understanding there's three different components, the connective tissue, the epithelial attachment, and the sulcus. Back in the 60s, Garjula, Wentz, and Orban, uh, they were the first to do I, I don't know if they did this on humans or if it was monkeys one or the other they they took a large data set and they found out that these 
numbers actually are some, somewhat predictable. Unfortunately, the, the subsequent perio literature almost made it seem like those are the perfect numbers or those are the quote unquote right numbers. And what we're going to look at in a moment is there's a standard deviation, there's a bell curve to the distribution of people's zones of attached tissue, zones of epithelial attachment, zones of a normal sulcus. So these are guidelines, one millimeter, one millimeter, one millimeter. That's a great way to conceptually think of it, but those are not hard and fast rules. This photo should be seared in our brains as restorative dentists. And that's really all I really wanted to, to talk about was this photo and then do some exercises using this photo. So before I move on, does, is this clear? Does everybody have a pretty good command over what this apparatus means? We're not talking about the restorative margin yet and where it goes, because that's a little farther down today's conversation. But under normal conditions, does this make sense? Cool. Uh, I think this photo is maybe a mi little bit misleading. The periodontal ligament is actually much smaller. This zone is not as wide as it is. When you bone sound and you put the probe down here and you zip through the uh, epithelial attachment and the connective tissue, you're going to hit bone right here. Not, it's not sitting over here. Um, this is a little bit misleading. Wherever there's a photo that's misleading, I just want to bring attention to it so that we understand what's happening when we do things like bone sounding. Um, so, f did they teach you bone sounding? It was that part of your curriculum? If you're not there, John, since you guys were classmates, you know, is that a regular part of your curriculum? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, can you tell me, and I'm not trying to put you guys on the spot, I'm trying to get a sense of what you know so that I don't repeat it. Uh, when did they teach bone sounding? Was it just part of the perio curriculum? Here's this thing, or were you using it as part of your analysis when doing a crown, say, per se? I, I don't know about you, Sophie. I got a lot more of it on the clinic floor. It was kind of just one evaluating, um, like I think, just like you said, with a crown margin or where you think your crown margin is going to go. Um, right. It really only came up like the last year and a half or so. Right. I yeah. feel like it came up in perio. And then, yeah, it was something that oops, it was something that might come up um, on the clinic floor. Although I feel like I maybe only did it once, probably depended on, you know, who your group practice later, all that kind of stuff was. Um, so, but I have the general idea of like what to do and right. and when to do it. So, I was talking to Dr. Libby today about it. And the reason why I think this is one of those perceived academic exercises, when I say perceived, it's an academic exercise that is perceived as ha having only academic value. And I would bring one's attention to this right here. This is a patient he did the upper arch today. He redid all these crowns. These crowns were invading biologic width. This patient had these crowns for 15, 20 years. He did the bone sounding exercise or he did the biologic width determining exercise and he found that all of these were invading biologic width. Um, so he's obviously gonna be doing some crown lengthening up here and then redoing the crowns. Uh, but that's where patients live much of the time. And what's hard is as a clinician, if your patients aren't complaining and things aren't falling out, it's easy to assume that everything you're doing is working. And this is one of those times where mm, if you take a closer look, it's really not working. And that's where, you know, taking a lot more focus and attention, I think, uh, comes in handy. So keep in mind that when you see older dentistry and you see this reddened tissue above the crown, it's one of two things. It's either an allergy to the base metal underneath, which very well may be the case, or it's an invasion of biologic width. Um, either way, Dr. Libby's going and he's cleaning everything out because she wanted an aesthetic rehab and she wanted a biological rehab and getting proper biologic width is, is part of that. So 
here's the here's the exercise. <clears throat> this was presented by Spear. I've used it ever since. I call it the Nikade biologic with biologic with al algorithm. Um, I guess it's more Spears. I think I've put a, a spin or two on it. But in a nutshell, <clears throat> when you have a patient that presents and you have to make the determination whether or not you can place a subgingival margin or whether you can do a gingivectomy for aesthetic reasons, you really have to go through this exercise. So the first step is to probe the sulcus. That gives you your, your pocket depth. Now what's tricky here is you really should have a healthy pocket. So if the patient's bleeding, I wouldn't use that data because you don't know whether you're probing the bottom of a pocket or whether you're sitting in uh, detached junctional epithelium. So if you ever have bleeding, just know that data is potentially erroneous. So you write down the pocket depth and then you bone sound. Bone sound involves pressing hard with pressure. Uh, obviously the patient needs to be numb for this point because you're going through connective tissue which has a large degree of innervation. Uh, but it's important that you angle the probe towards the tooth. Because we have to remember teeth are conically shaped. It's easy sometimes to just press parallel to the crown of the tooth, when in reality, the root surface is at a very different axial inclination underneath where you're going. So you might get an error with that and there's been times where I haven't done this as well as I should and I actually slide on the buccal bone you end up kind of losing a uh, apical stop so to say and then it kind of just slips away from you um, you do it once and you probably probably won't do it again uh, but always remember to point the perio probe towards the center of the tooth the more parallel to it you are the better but since you can't see down there you have to make an assessment on the approximate axial inclination. When you do those two measurements, the difference is the patient's biologic width. So up to this point, is that more or less what you and E is teaching? Yes. Awesome, all right. So this information is helpful, but it's not it's not an answer that gives you any sort of clinical relevance without doing something else with it. Uh, so the next step would be to add a millimeter. And that millimeter is the average pocket, which is difficult to say because the ideal pocket is 0 0.69 millimeters, which nobody lives in, the, in that state of ideal health. But that's just what the ideal periodontal apparatus socket or pocket depth is. <laughs> Um, and normal can be up to three millimeters, where normal is simply defined as the patient's normal in the absence of disease. So when we say what is normal, uh, it's somewhat rele relevant to the situation. But in general, one millimeter is a very stable pocket depth. There's plenty of room for the patient to be able to keep it clean. Uh, it's not so deep that you're likely to get uh, anaerobes down in there, which then could set up and, and cause a periodontal infection. Uh, but you have to have some sort of idea of how deep you want your pocket. It's always safe to say a millimeter, okay? If we take this zone and give it a name, call it the perio zone. If somebody else has another name for it, I'd love to hear it. It's often called the biologic width. Biologic width does not include the pocket. That was this here, add the pocket, and we'll call that the perio zone. The perio zone is essentially the zone where you do not want to have any restoratives, uh, any restorative margins within that zone, with the exception of things like biodentin and bioceramic sealers, where you're doing, say, external root repairs and what have you. Uh, but for the everyday restorative practice, this is the area where you don't want to go. So let's just take this example situation. Um, three millimeter sulcus, six millimeter bone sound. What's our biologic width? Three millimeters. 
So let's add one millimeter for the pocket. We now know from the crest to bone, we can place a margin, a restorative margin, four millimeters or more and have it be a safe restorative margin. What do I mean by a safe restorative margin? Bonnie, you want to take a stab at what I mean by that? I would think by a safe restorative margin, you mean that your margin is not going to cause inflammation of the periodontium. Exactly. What's it? What's one? Uh, that's the most likely scenario. What's another sequelae that sometimes can happen? Happens with gummy patients that come in and they have gingivectomies done without this exercise so rebound rebound yep so you can think of rebound as an inflammatory process it may or may not be classified under inflammation um, it's more the body saying i want that tissue back there so it replaces it uh, versus chronic inflammation which means it doesn't grow the tissue back it's just the tissue that's there stays in a chronically inflamed state so can we do a gingivectomy on this patient? That's really what this comes down to because when we're doing restorative dentistry, there's times when we have too much tissue and we just want to remove the tissue. If you don't do this exercise, you're likely to run into long-term problems. You want to be able to ask, answer the question, can I do a gingivectomy? And if so, how much can I reduce and be confident that I won't have any untoward effects in this situation? Yes, you can remove two millimeters. This was a three millimeter sulcus. We bone sounded to determine that there was a three millimeter biologic width. We add on a millimeter. Once we do that, we get to four. What's the difference between four and the bone sound? It's two millimeters. And we know our math is right because if we take two millimeters off the existing sulcus, we're left with a one millimeter sulcus. That makes sense. It's not supposed to be that easy, guys. <laughs> All right, so let's do a few more. So one millimeter sulcus. This is a different patient or a different clinical scenario. Three millimeter bone sound. The patient's biologic width is two millimeters. This is the most common outcome that you're going to have. If you follow the perio literature, at least in the 60s and 70s, that was the number they went with. It was like 2.01 was the average biologic width for all patients. You're going to find some patients have three millimeters. Some have three and a half. Some have one and a half. I've seen one, one millimeter. Uh, it's good to know what the bi biologic width of your patient is. And you can use other teeth. I found this to be consistent from patient to patient. So if I'm doing a crown lengthening on number eight, and for whatever reason, I don't want to bone sound that tooth, you could do number six or number five, determine their biologic width, and then superimpose that data onto tooth number eight. So the biologic width is a parameter that exists from patient to patient on all of their teeth. So back to this exercise here, two millimeter biologic width, add a millimeter for the pocket, we now know three millimeters from the bone is a safe restorative margin. Can we do a gingivectomy here? And the answer is no. We have to do crown lengthening, CLP for crown lengthening procedure. So it's this exercise that helps us understand what periodontal procedures may or may not need to be done. So I have a few more exercises, but I think we, we all have the point or get the point that Understanding this stuff and using it in our, in our everyday restorative practice is, is super important. Thoughts, questions? Was, was this too basic? Um, so I, I think it's stuff we've heard, Dr. Roy. I do have a question, though, in regards to the extra millimeter you're adding for pocket depth, wouldn't that be encompassed in the sulcus measurement? Sorry, I guess, what's the differentiating factor between those two? So the 
Good question. The pocket depth that you're measuring in the beginning is where you're starting. When we're adding the millimeter in the equation, we're determining where our end point is going to be. And we're, we're building in the biologic width, which is determined by the patient's body. And then we're adding a millimeter for a future pocket so that we know where we can place a restorative margin on the tooth. So the, the calculation that involves adding a millimeter for the pocket is asking the question, where on the tooth can you place a restorative margin and not have inflammation? I think this was definitely helpful because I feel like these concepts have been taught kind of separately. And, you know, some of this is like, oh, well, that's obvious to how they're related, but I feel like it hasn't been shown in that way. We don't do a lot of crown lengthening or gingivectomies at school. So that was really good. Yeah, good. You know, where, where this comes in, very helpful is lower second molars. Those teeth are always, always short as far as anatomical crown that's exposed to the oral environment. Can you go in there and do a gingivectomy? Actually, a lot of times on that tooth you can, but I wouldn't do it unless you, you have this kind of thought process that goes through there. There are few teeth that have temporaries fall off more than number 18 and number 31. So understanding this allows you to predictably go in and do a gingivectomy at the same time as the crown prep. And that's what's beautiful about this is when you understand this stuff, you don't have to send the patient to the periodontist. Um, obviously, if you're uncomfortable, go ahead and do it. But most of the time, the answer is pretty clear once you understand the algorithm. You end up saving the patient a lot of time and headache and you also get to do an additional procedure. It's not about the money and the production, but if you can be efficient with your time and charge for what you're doing, uh, you should be well compensated for it. So a lot of times when I do this, uh, depending if it's an insurance patient or not, you know, I'll cut the patient a deal, just say, look, I had to get out the electrosurge, I had to get out the laser, I had to use a number 12 blade or whatever, some sutures, you know, maybe $200, $300 for something that took me 10 minutes versus sending the patient to the periodontist. They, every time they go to the periodontist, they get a full mouth probing. It's an hour, hour and a half comp exam. Uh, that's a lot for a patient that doesn't necessarily have periodontal needs other than that one tooth. So Christian and I were talking about it's a, it's a lure in the tackle box. Having this sit there so that when the time presents itself, you have the ability to use it is super powerful. And once you use it, you're going to start to say, how did I ever practice without it? It's kind of like a rubber dam or a double cord technique. One of those things, once you cross to the other side, you can't go backwards. So that was it. I just wanted to shine a spotlight on that. There is a YouTube video on the Nikkei channel on this that I did. Actually, it was the first video I ever did. Uh, it goes over this in a little more detail. I'll probably redo that video at some point. Uh, I have more clarity in how to articulate the problem, although I, I feel like I was bouncing around a little bit today, um, but I think I got the point across. But take a look at the video. Just go to the New England Center for Advanced Dental Education YouTube channel and type in Biologic Width, and it'll be there. And if there's anything I missed or sp spoke erroneously on, let me know. Uh, yeah. There's almost 100 views, so it has provided value to other people out there. I think to go off what Dr. Roy said with kind of cutting the patient a deal sometimes, I think um, even today, this uh, subgenital restoration, I got in there, noticed that the decay, I'm suspecting external resorption, like a class one, um, I forget what the classification title is, but class one external resorption, get in there, bone level is right at it. and. I had told them we'd kind of do an exploratory, you know, flap here. And I've said, that I'm, I'm not going to really, you know, charge for it because I don't ultimately know if this tooth is actually going to be savable or not. So once I get in there and I had told the patient, we're just going to cost you, we're just going to charge you for flap and debridement. I'm going to go in there, scale. I might do some recontouring of the bone. I did, but like, um, I got so much benefit from just being able to do the procedure and being able to see it. 
patient pays a little bit for it, not the full cost of crown lengthening, but I get a rep under my belt, patient gets better care. Hopefully I bought that guy time, more time with that tooth. But he also knows that we're not out of the woods with that tooth. So it was kind of a win-win for all. Great. Or as Michael Scott says, a win-win-win. A win-win-win. That's the goal. <laughs> On that note, I have a, another meeting to go to, but thank you everybody for joining. Uh, please check out that video if any of this seemed a little bit um, out of left field. This concept is something we all have to have in our back pocket. And if you have any specific questions, shoot me an email. Have a good night, everybody. Go, go Celtics. Thanks, Doc. Good night.